So the first thing that you should know about me is that I'm a history buff, and I suffer from chronic wanderlust. So of course, last year, when I was given the chance to go for my school's history trip to Berlin, it was an opportunity I couldn't refuse. When I reached Berlin, the city far surpassed my expectations, not only for its food, its sights, and its people, but for its history. The history I'd once learned about Berlin seeped out of the textbook pages and into the streets, and it was absolutely surreal. But the most surreal was the Berlin Wall. So our tour guide showed us our first glimpse of the monument while we were walking along the busy streets of Berlin, and she pointed to a narrow pebble strip that rang amongst the, busy co um, amongst the cobblestone streets and said that this marked the root of the Berlin Wall. Now for something that looked so insignificant, I could hardly believe that this symbolized the divide between East and West Berlin that had been etched into the minds of its people even years after its fall. So given that this year marks the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, I'm not the only one giving the wall a second thought. In fact, according to a recent BBC article, even today, East Berlin is less economically prosperous than West Berlin, a fact that even our tour guide recounted to us when she pointed to buildings on opposing sides of the wall. So for me, the Berlin Wall truly sparked an epiphany. It stood as a testimony to history being as much about the present as it is about the past. Historians like to say that hindsight is 2020, yet apparently enough, we never really seem to learn from our mistakes. After seeing the Berlin Wall, I realized that even though to my teenage mind, the concept of a wall to divide two people seemed archaic and also kind of obsolete, many walls had been established around the world since that time, and it was a far from extinct concept. And so following looking at the Berlin Wall, I did what I do best when I get frustrated. I decided to create a brainstorm and write an article. Because not too long ago, I started pursuing one of my long found passions for writing. And I began writing for newspapers, the Indian Express, the Times of India, and the UK-based publication, uh, International Political Forum. So it was only after doing the research and writing this article that I realized that around the world, Many walls, literal and figurative, have been created or maintained since the time of the Berlin Wall. So I, for one, come from a walled subcontinent. As you've probably accurately guessed from my accent, I've lived abroad. In fact, I've lived outside of India for the majority of my life. I'm a Bihari from Eastern India, born in Mumbai in Western India, with a life spent largely in Oriental Singapore, and I hope to, spend, I hope to attend university in the West. So suffice to say that I'm your quintessential third culture confused kid. So if the diversity within my own roots hasn't been enough, attending a school where my closest friends over time have varied from Finnish to Korean to Dutch to Indonesian has made my worldview a conglomerate of sorts. So when people ask me, where is home? I find it difficult to pinpoint. I like to say that I was born in a plane that never really landed. So home is anywhere and everywhere, so long as the right people surround me. But having this amalgamated worldview has come with its own advantages. One being that I've been able to take a fairly detached perspective on a lot of contentious issues around the world, particularly those between India and its neighbor Pakistan. So it's almost funny to think that less than 70 years ago, our two countries were actually one nation. And although today that there is no concrete wall between our countries, there's definitely a very real, emotionally charged, figurative wall that has acted as a divisive force, creating much antipathy which extends beyond just the realms of our usual cricket field jingoisms. In fact, India and Pakistan play act this sentiment of antipathy 365 days a year. So if you were to go online and watch videos of the sparring yet flamboyant change of guard ceremony at the Wagga border between India and Pakistan, it almost seems like two children trying to outwit and outplay each other at their favorite game. But this coordination and cooperation, I can assure you, which these two countries find so hard to achieve on all other occasions, only comes into play when creating this routine that both sides, without ever having rehearsed with each other, can perform completely in unison. So basically, I don't quite get the India and Pakistan wall at all. Let me explain why. I remember once while on a family vacation to Europe, a familiar South Asian face got chatting with us, and turned out he was Pakistani. 
life in Lahore, Delhi, corrupt politicians, Bollywood movies, and even kebabs and biryani were discussed. And at the end, when he got up to leave, <coughs> he said, Hang sab hai bhen hai, which in Hindi translates to, we're all brothers and sisters after all. So hearing this really made me grin, because in my mind, there was no distinction between us, and in his mind, there really wasn't either. In fact, on many cultural issues, I can probably relate far more with a Pakistani friend than an Indian friend at times. But if media is to believe, be believed, India is India, and Pakistan is Pakistan, and never the two shall meet. So whether these walls are literal or figurative, I find that the amount of effort we put into holding them up is an absolutely futile exercise. So let's look at the border between North and South Korea. According to a 2013 World Service poll, 90% of South Koreans thought that North Korea is a hostile country, not to be associated with or even cooperated with. It's almost ironic to think that these two nations, like India and Pakistan, were one nation not too long ago. And although I can concede that the socio-political structures in each of these countries have acted as defining forces, I think something else lies as the answer for making these countries so remarkably different. In my opinion, the answer lies with the DMZ, the demilitarized zone which runs along the vicinity of the 38th parallel north, which has perpetuated this demarcation and differentiation. The DMZ acts like an iron curtain of sorts. It prevents the permeability of common ideas and of a common vision. And so, of course, it's molded these countries into different societies. But the literal walls around the world aren't actually where the problems arise. They're solely a physical representation of people's mindsets. So let's shift regions. Let's talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because the Israeli separation border epitomizes this to me like no other example. So the separation border, constructed to block out terrorist attacks from the West Bank, in my opinion, is nothing but a byproduct of a fairly narrow perspective on an area which has been generalized into a threat. And this border has created a significant amount of tension in the area because I think it sends a very clear message. It says there's a you and there's an us, and we're different. So when I see interviews of teenagers on either sides of the conflict, probably not very different from myself, enthusiastically discuss joining the war effort. I wonder how they've justified that they're fighting for the right side, their side. I find it's difficult to substantiate when the only difference you have for calling someone the enemy is a border. Isn't it tough to justify who is right and who is wrong? But the literal walls around the world aren't just the ones that frustrate me. They're also the deeply segregating ones that we have in our minds. So let's talk about two of our favorite teenage pet peeves, beauty and intelligence. As a teenager, I've come to realize that the incessant need to be beautiful over time has become convoluted. Beauty has become confined to one archetypal person that fits within the confines of a box defined by balls that identify beauty. So in the West, if you had a flat stomach, a thigh gap, and a good-looking face, you would be called beautiful. For men, if you had washboard abs and a good-looking face, you would be told you're hot. In India, we like to categorize people into what you could call our 50 shades of brown. If you had a dark skin complexion, you would be told that you're less than average looking. But if you had a fair milky white complexion, suddenly you're a Shwarya Rai. <laughs> so even as a kid, I would look at my mirror and I would stare and wonder, what if I don't fit the box? Today, our society has become so obsessed with this narrow definition of beauty that in a city like Seoul, 20% of women between the age of 19 and 49 have had some sort of reconstructive surgery done to alter their appearances. In my opinion, it's getting a bit ridiculous. I mean, are we really trying to fight our genetic coding to fit within the confines of a box? Even worse, do we as societies value these rigid definitions so much that we would be willing to compromise on individuality? But there's good news, because recently I saw a step taken in to counter these very uh, defining definitions of beauty. And this was when I was walking through the financial district, and I saw the newest Desigual campaign. So the campaign featured a new model called Chantelle Brown Young, who was recently featured on America's Next Top Model. And what makes Chantelle unique, though, is that she has vitiligo, a skin condition which causes the depigmentation of your skin. And it's a disease which she had been mocked and ridiculed for her entire life, being labeled a cow and a panda. 
But seeing Chantal's face on this advertisement campaign was a breath of fresh air. Not only because it was a familiar face that I recognized from one of my favorite TV shows to binge watch, but because it was a breath of fresh air because she showed an example of someone actively defying the boundaries of beauty in society and being successful while doing so. But the concept of intelligence is another one that I think requires a bit more scrutiny. When we look at, um, as a 12th grade student, I've recently come to realize that the, there is a lot of emphasis given to academics in defining our intelligence. And so recently, I've had to deal with going through the infinite number of standardized tests which measure your aptitude and scores that will determine my university prospects. And so with this, I've come to realize that intelligence, like beauty, seems to have been boxed in by a series of walls of scores and grades. But what frustrates me is actually the inflexibility of this definition. Given that we acknowledge that there are different learning types, why are tests that are so often used to determine our academic potential not actually inclusive of all learning patterns? Furthermore, in high school, it's compulsory to take a science, math, English, humanities, and often even a foreign language. So what if I was bad at even two of these subjects and my IB points or my GPA were to drop drastically? Would I then be justly labeled not too smart, regardless of maybe having the courage to come up here and give a TED talk while my heart is palpitating away? Why is that not just, why is that not quantified? So the people I think we actually have to credit for their intelligence are ones like Mr. Arunachala Muruganantham. So recently, Mr. Muruganantham was named a visionary and for his, and dubbed the sanitary napkin man, for his work in creating low-cost sanitary napkins to counter the very traditional and backwards female hygiene practices in rural India. But this is a man who only had an education till the age of 14. So, Mr. Muruganantanam would never have been considered even remotely intelligent by anyone up until recently. But by breaking the walls of, of what defines an intelligent person in society, He's acted as an inspiration. And to be honest, his work shows the thought process of nothing but a genius to me. So while the world celebrates the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall this year, I think we all have some thinking to do. When I was younger, I saw walls as purely physical constructions. Brick, concrete, barbed wire, mortar, it didn't matter. They were simply constructions that were meant to keep us within a confined space and for the most part, were irrelevant. But it was only after I grew up that I started to realize that our society is filled with more nuanced and subtle walls that at times were more harmful than the literal walls around us. And now with the greater understanding of the implications of the walls around us, I want to see a change. So maybe as a youth somewhat naively optimistic about the future, I want to be able to relinquish the baggage of the walls that I've inherited but I don't want to embark on this endeavor alone. I want us all to do it together. So I want to take us back to 1989, where we can all be Berliners, confronting that harrowing wall in front of us and have the courage to hack away and break down these walls that define us. Thank you. <laughs>